Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, so I'm probably going to be uh, hitting you a little bit out of, out of left field with this presentation, coming to Microsoft Research and, and seeing super cool stuff like, uh, like um, David was just showing you. But um, what I want to talk about is the efforts that we've been making in, in, in the group that I work in um, to build a prediction engine for the planet. And I'll explain what, what I mean um, by that and, and be showing you some examples throughout the talk. So... I work in a group called Computational Ecology and Environmental Sciences, where uh, I like to say that we, we work on the science policy and tools and technology necessary to um, conserve or sustain Earth's life support systems. And we work in Microsoft Research, so we do that by marrying up the data um, to the models to, to make robust predictions in order to um, allow people to try and set effective, um, effective policy. And so, Anytime I tell people that I'm a computational ecologist or an ecologist in general that works for Microsoft Research, I always get, why Microsoft? Um, I usually come back at that with, um, well, why doesn't every company have a, a computational ecologist? But, uh, <laughs> but to, to, to avoid having to have one-on-one -on -one arguments with every single one of you throughout this um, talk, we'll, we'll focus on why Microsoft. And, and I really like to think that it's because Microsoft, and particularly the Microsoft Research here in Cambridge, truly understands the power of predictions. You've been hearing some of the really cool stuff that has been going on in this building, things like um, um, the movie recommender, infer.net, all the cool um, prediction technologies that people are starting to do with Connect. I don't know if um, any of you have had, had the opportunity to find out about the predictable data centers work that has come out of here. Really, really fantastic stuff. And so, so we really are... Um, I might be an ecologist and somebody else might be in the machine learning group, but what we're all interested in doing is making robust predictions. Um, what we're trying to make predictions about might, might be different. But of course, from a corporate, pers corporate perspective as well, we're really interested in making predictions. Bing is, is, is basically all about making predictions, and, and Bing Travel is really one of um, the, the most fantastic uh, examples, I like to think, of, of how Bing is being used, as Microsoft used to call it, as a decision engine, right? because we're making predictions about what flight prices are going to be doing over time, and we're literally giving you a thumbs up or a thumbs down um, decision support mechanism for whether or not you should buy a flight now. So, um, so I think that's great, and, and there's a, a nice quote from, um, from, from our CEO on that exact same topic. And so what's interesting, people say, why Microsoft? And I read that quote from Steve Ballmer, and, and that hits me exactly um, in my in my in my nerve center of, of, of um, intellectual interests. And so I'm an ecologist, but, but that's really where we're all coming from here. And so the thing about predictions is when you can make really good ones like we do with, um, like we do with um, Bing Travel, you can enable people to make some strong decisions. You can enable people to make what might seem like, if you're unaware, of the power of, of the science and the data and the technologies that go behind these predictions, to make some crazy predictions, right? So um, you can see some of the kids in the audience start to freak out a little bit. This is Chris Bishop. Um, we're kind of circling back. You heard him talk on, on the power of inference this morning. And so you can tell, right, it's not just Corp that believes in the power of predictions. This is Chris putting his, his head on the line here. Um, so you can see, now, Chris is a distinguished scientist in the company. So if, if he looks a little bit nervous, you know that, you know, and, and look at him. He's a little bit, he's a little bit you know, he believes, but, but there's always that angel of doubt sitting there, right? <laughs> well, look at that. All right. <laughs> so, so that's fantastic, right? And, and, you know, most of you don't go to work and pull a bowling ball back to your foreheads every day. But you do that every day, right? We rely on robust predictions to build our society. Those of you who came in cars or trains or planes or are sitting higher than others or maybe were brave enough to go more than one floor off the, off the ground floor in a building, right? You're using strong predictions that are um, built off of a, of a strong intellectual, experimental, scientific, and data-driven um, 
um, framework. So, you know, Chris Bishop didn't die because we have a long history, <laughs> thankfully, right? Um, otherwise, we wouldn't know as much about inference as, uh, as we do now. Um, but, you know, Chris Bishop didn't die because we've been able to combine data, theory, and experiments to make near predictive certainty, right? I mean, Chris couldn't know for sure that that bowling ball was going to come back and crack him in the head. Maybe there was a guy standing at the other end that was just going to give it a little push, right? Um, but, but he knew enough that he could constrain the assumptions and the uncertainty in the underlying model in his mind and make an actionable prediction about whether or not that's crazy or actually a rational decision to, to stand there with his head behind that thing. Now, what we think about in our computational ecology group is that we're actually doing this every day as well, right? And most of you, again, probably don't think of it in this way. But through deforestation, ocean acidification, CO2 emissions, species extinctions, all of this, we really are pulling that bowling ball back to our heads and letting it go. The problem with doing that is unlike that physical bowling ball in, in the world that, that we know and understand, we don't actually have a strong understanding of the fundamental laws that govern what the, how far that pendulum is going to swing. Not only that, but there's one Earth. So we can't have this replicable experimental design process. And so, you know, Chris didn't die. He pulled that bowling ball back to his head. He made a good bet. Um, what we're doing with some of our, our Earth's life support systems probably isn't a good idea if you believe in this kind of data-driven um, um, engineering kind of principle approach to making decisions. And, and this really is causing problems. So one of the... Um, one of the my favorite authors also happens to have a, um, a fantastic quote that I get to, use in, um, get to use in my talks. And of course, you know, climate is what you get, or climate is what you expect, weather is what you get. And the problem is, is as climates are changing, for, for example, we don't really know how to make actionable predictions because we don't have that strong theoretical understanding. And mind you, this is a system that we probably understand from a, from a physical sense better than most other environmental systems. We're still unclear on how we scale back our uncertainty about what's going to happen into the future from a climate perspective and what that's going to mean from a weather perspective. And this matters fundamentally from an economics perspective, from a governance perspective, right? I mean, when you're, when you're putting in the new sewage system for Seattle, these are, you know, very expensive municipal projects, for example, and they really want to know, should I put in a pipe like that or should I put in a pipe like that, right? And you can't just be like, well, put in a pipe like that because the taxpayers have to pay for it, and if they don't need it, they're not going to be too pleased. So um, right now, literally, we're, we're stuck in a bit of a, um, a quagmire on this, and, and this graph here is a um, number of billion-dollar weather, weather billion-dollar loss events from, from the insurance industry over time from, from 1980 to, to 2010. You can see it's going up. The insurance companies are suffering pretty heavily from this lack of ability to make actionable predictions. And so what this really kind of brings me back to is, um, is actually a quote from before my time, um, but uh, from former US President Jimmy Carter, who some of you uh, may remember. And if you paid attention um, to, to some of the uh, the world events that were going on, the U.S. was going through a significant energy crisis, right? People were lined up for miles down the street to go to petrol stations. They were worried that tomorrow wasn't going to be like they knew today was and yesterday was. They didn't know if they, when they turned on their lights, the lights were going to turn on. They didn't know when they stopped at the petrol station, there was going to be petrol. And that uncertainty really brought up a massive societal unrest. And, and it was one of the defining moments in... in in the U.S. over the past couple of decades where, where people actually came together to, um, to get our, well, maybe to get ourselves out of it or maybe just to delay that into the future. But, um, but you know, this quote, as we're losing our confidence in the future, we're also closing the door on our past. And I think that's hugely um, relevant to the things that are going on with the environment um, today. And so what we're trying to do in, in the computational ecology group is build this prediction engine for the planet. And you can see what we're trying to do is marry up a whole bunch of models of, of things that we care about. Everything from forest mortality to climate and deforestation, terrestrial carbon, fire risk, agricultural yields, to mention a, a hugely um, valuable um, 
industry that, that is um, kind of shaking at the knees right now, worrying about things like climate change, serving up the, the predictions and the ability to manipulate those models through simple to use APIs, bringing predictions, data, and things like that back to enable kind of in a, in a classic sense this ecosystem of partners, right, of people to be able to go on and make actionable predictions based on the environmental models that we're running. So I was putting this slide deck together this morning, and I, and I put that together, and I was kind of happy with it. Um, and, and then I realized as I was going through it, oh, I forgot the data step, right? So, so um, and that's a critical one. It's actually near to my heart, and it's one of the things that I, I handle in our group. So it's a bit, um, a bit erroneous of me, of, of me to miss it. And so really, these models that we're building here, they're, they're data-hungry models. We need to confront them with, with points of observation in the past to see if our models actually can replicate what's previously happened so that we can have a bit more confidence and certainty that they might be able to replicate what's going to happen to the future. And so, you know, that shouldn't be a problem in the one respect, right? Venerable institutions like The Economist um, tell us that there's a data deluge, right? Here's, here's a, um, a businessman harvesting a bunch of data and using it to grow some genetically modified crops, for, for example. Um, so, on the one hand, I completely agree with that. From an environmental standpoint, we are suffering a data deluge, right? I mean, satellite imagery is one of those things that everybody in this room, your life has been fundamentally changed by an extra dimension by which you can contextualize your existence. Satellite imagery has changed all of that. The daily use of satellite imagery is fantastic. This is daily modus, right? 250 meter resolution, so this isn't even the high resolution stuff. It's 250 meter resolution, about 6 million pixels streaming in every day, and, and there's all sorts of other information that's coming in in the, in the typical big data paradigm. But if you hang around Microsoft researchers for very long, you realize that we're actually not all that interested in big data. Don't really care how big your data are. Um, we care about how much information is in your data. And in that respect, from an environmental context, we're suffering a bit of an information drought. So ecology, this is a, a, a Wikipedia definition of ecology, right? Um, so I'm sure my, my professors at university would be happy that I um, pulled that up. But, uh, <laughs> but, you know, funny enough, Wikipedia's done it as well as they have. So, um, so a scientific study of interactions among organisms and their environment and the interactions organisms have with each other and their abiotic environment. Okay. So, what do we mean by that? So, if I want to understand ecology, that means I need to understand, okay, well, where, how many species are there? Where are they? What are they doing where, where they are? How are they interacting with each other? How do those interactions create the resulting ecosystem services that we all depend on? And on and on and on. It's not just about RGB from satellite imagery data streaming in and everybody saying, oh, why are you complaining, right? Look at all the data that's coming in. I turn around and I say, well, what's the information content of those data? It's actually quite low from... from from a ratio perspective, right? Because we really want to understand how all this is going to respond to, to changing environments. And I put this down here in a, in a small picture because um, the amount of data that we have on this stuff is small. This is, um, this is an ecological network, a network of species as these nodes and all the little connections are um, who eats whom sort of relationships. So that's fantastic. You know, this is actually created with um, a software program called Network 3D, created um, by scientists in our group. But how many of these data sets do we actually have? Less than 100? How many of them do we have over time? Even fewer than that. How many of them do we have over space? We're literally down onto one hand. And we're talking about the entire Earth um, for trying to understand some of the fundamental processes that keep us all here every day. So. From a data perspective, what, what we're trying to do in our group is, is um, a bit of a multifaceted approach. This is one thing, a technology, nature, te technology for Nature initiative. Can you raise your hand if you stop by our fantastic booth this morning? Come on, it was the one with the trees, the elephant, all that kind of stuff. The drones, how can you pass by a drone, right? <laughs> um, so um, so this, this is an initiative with Zoological Society of London, University College of London, and, and us at Microsoft Research is trying to develop the new devices. If, how many of you here don't know about Gadgeteer, for example? Has everybody heard of Gadgeteer? Nobody's heard of Gadgeteer. Okay, you, you need to learn about Gadgeteer. I'm not going to give a talk about Gadgeteer. But that's a, that's a fantastic platform that really will change the way you think about hardware. It will make you understand that hardware 
is no longer immutable. You can change hardware like you change software, and it's simply fantastic. So we're using Gadgeteer to, to build these novel data collection devices and, and to try, try to create what I like to call a ubiquitous computing of the environment. And to have such a ubiquitous computing environment, you need devices to be small, you need them to be cheap, reprogrammable, repurposable, and very, very power efficient. This is one device that we've created in our group that, called Mataki um, that is just that. And it's super small, super cheap, orders of magnitude cheaper than anything else on the market. Um, we don't sell it. We, we're working on licensing it. And it's got some software that sits on there that sets up a mesh network across all the animals within the ecosystem that, that are wearing it. Um, and when one comes by, um, it, it will download everybody else's data onto a base station. Just so you know, this is what Gadgeteer comes in a little kit like this. And it's just a bunch of bits and bobs that you can plug together in a kind of Lego style fashion. Anyway, I'll, I'll move on. We're also working with the world's largest conservation organization, the International Union for the Cons Conservation of Nature, and their red list to help them handle all of their spatial data, but more importantly, collect a lot more of it. Because we don't know um, very much about the threats to species. We might know where species are, but we don't really know what the pressures they are, they're facing are and how those are changing over time. So we're working with, with um, SQL Server databases and, and things like that to, to try and get data collection up to speed. If you would have stopped at that booth, you all would have also seen something called Fetch Climate, which is really a, um, an ability to retrieve global environmental information with the click of a button or a few lines of code. And at least in the environmental sector, this is kind of transformative because we're trained as ecologists. There are very few among us who are very computationally um, proficient because that's not really in our training. We're busy learning about the environment. And, um, but, but increasingly, we need to run models and have understanding about the future of the environment, which requires, as I said before, confronting our models with data. How do you get those data? Right now, they're in really complex spatial formats, really big databases that are pretty gnarly to work with. Um, many of you probably spend your days dealing with databases like these. So we're trying to get those, that difficulty out of the way so that, so that normal people like me can, can, um, can use them. So <coughs> on to the models really quickly here. Um, so this is the, really the key intellectual core of, of the work that we're doing in our group. And so I just want to show you a bunch of examples. This is just one that's kind of close to my heart because I'm really interested in the question, which is a really old one in ecology, of how many species are there. Um, we don't actually know, but there's all sorts of different statistical methods for finding that out, right? And this is a pretty simple mechanistic model which is, uh, says we think that as, as time goes on, we get more efficient at describing species, that as there's more taxonomists or people out there searching for species, we should find more, and that <coughs> as we approach, as the number of species that we know starts to approach the total number of species that we don't know, it should be, get, it should be more difficult, right? It's like bobbing for apples, and, and, and um, the fewer apples that are in there, the, easier, the harder it is to randomly encounter one. So, I don't necessarily expect you to be all that interested in this, but, but um, it is a, um, an inherently nonlinear model that's inherently kind of hard to solve, right? We've got some data in, in blue, and we've got some uh, um, parameters in, in red, and we've got to solve for that. So we solve for that using a Bayesian estimation engine that we cr created in our group called, um, called Filsback. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's proved really useful for fitting all sorts of models that I'm going to show you. Um, in, into the um, future. So if you cared for plants, it's about 17% more. Um, <laughs> take, you can take that away, right, um, if anything. Okay, so let's, let's talk about something else. Well, we can predict terrestrial carbon. One of the major sources of uncertainty in general circulation models, the IPCC is set to be launching their next report in a week or so, right? What's the major source of uncertainty in their ability to make robust predictions? It's actually global carbon uptake, <coughs> terrestrial carbon uptake. It's uncertain. As you can see, this is a suite of different modeling efforts. And this is above zero and below zero. It is uncertain whether terrestrial carbon is going to be a sink, i.e., the trees are going to, and soil, etc., is going to take carbon out and keep it. Or is it going to be a source? Is it going to release it, right? Are we going to cut down the Amazon, burn it, and release all that carbon back up into the atmosphere? Well, what we've been doing in our group is building a, a very, um, a, a model that takes balanced complexity into account. So at every step we say, well, how important is this component in the model? And, and when I say important, we measure that with, with formal uncertainty methods. 
And we put that all together, and we also say, how important is it computationally? Because oftentimes, as scientists, we love to just say, oh, throw this in there, throw this in there, throw this in there, and then you can't run it. Or you can run it once, and it takes about seven years, and, um, and then somebody says, ooh, I screwed up that, and you're like, well. Um, so, so that's what we're interested in. And the nice thing about our methods is it allows us to start to, to poke our model, right? Because our model says, oh, this part, if you fix this part, overall model uncertainty is going to be reduced maximally. That's the information content of the data and the model components that we're really chasing. So we've done that, right? And um, this is work primarily of a guy named Matthew Smith in our group. And we've produced the first fully data constrained terrestrial carbon map of the world. Um, which is pretty fantastic. I mean, who would have thought that Microsoft Research would have been the, um, the, the first to do that? Well, what else, um, who else sucks up or releases carbon into the atmosphere? Well, the marine world does, and particularly phytoplankton, those tiny little guys that um, cause algal blooms and things like that. So what do, we, what do we have here? I won't get into the details, but another model that does fantastically well, the dark line are data, and this... this um, grayish band here is, is the uncertainty, bounded um, uncertainty around our model predictions. And you can see, again, this is one of the first efforts to do so well at predicting the, um, the phytoplankton dynamics over time across the, the world's oceans. So we're also interested in predicting roads and deforestation and the complex interplay between those two things because deforestation causes roads to come and roads cause deforestation away from their boundaries. So you can see here we're using some visualization software for, for these kinds of data to run through um, a um, model output from, from some of our former PhD students and now um, postdocs. And so just being able to vis model this stuff, predict it, and visualize it is really, really fantastic from uh, the perspective of people who are trying to do something with this kind of information. Because we're, we're trying to take this science out of the domain of just doing it publishing it, putting a static map in a, in a PDF and printing it out and handing it to a policymaker, whatever that is, and, and, um, and saying, righto, you know, uh, do something good with it. Um, in this case, they can inspect it, they can change it, they can ask different questions about it. This is, um, I mentioned agricultural earlier, agriculture earlier, right? I mean, everybody cares about agriculture. Most of your company's portfolios probably in some way, if you trace all of the, you know, the derivatives back somewhere, You've got some um, futures commodities markets in there. Um, so, you know, here is under a two degree Celsius warming scenario, global projected wheat yields in, in tons per hectare. Um, you can see that certain places are going to be winners under this scenario and certain places are going to be losers. People want to know who's going to win and who's going to lose, where and why. We're also trying to predict things like biodiversity. So. Um, what are, what's the fate of species and, and the diversity of species into the future under accepted socioeconomic policy scenarios that like maybe the United Nations has come up with, things like that. So we've got two, sim two complementary approaches to trying to do this at the moment. One's a really simple statistical model. It doesn't look simple, but um, compared to the other one it is. So maybe I should say um, <laughs> relatively simple statistical model. Um, and, uh, you know, so a while back, when I was doing my PhD, I used to always be offended when people would say it's what I was doing was simple. And now I take it as a quite, you know, a significant portion or part of my pride because um, I've spent a lot of time doing complex things and I don't want to be associated with them. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, so we've got a very simple statistical model, which I'll run through, and a, a very more complex process-based model. They're both hugely interesting. They're both helpful for assessing scenarios, but they both have a lot of assumptions. But critically, they also both let us project into the future two internationally accepted biodiversity monitoring metrics, the Redless Index and the Living Planet Index. The Redless Index, which is, um, which is overseen by the IUCN, which we have a corporate partnership with, and the Living Planet Index, which is overseen by um, Zoological Society of London, WWF, and one of our former postdocs now actually runs the Living Planet Index for um, ZSL. And so the simple one, um, only requires us to take the um, UN um, socioeconomic scenarios um, that take into account how food crops, energy crops, livestock, and forestry, and all sorts of other things are going to change. Take a hugely complex um, model of how land use is going to respond to all of that. Take another hugely complex result of global climate models and what future climate is going to be. But then take a relatively simplistic statistical approach of correlating presence-absence of species 
with their current environmental um, characteristics, and then projecting that into the future, and then refining that with best ecological knowledge of, of where species are, are going to occur, and thinking about how they might be able to disperse. How will they get from where they are now to where we think they're going to have to go? And if we put in all sorts of um, other so, uh, inf ecological information, we can start to figure out things like density and potential population size and eventually calculate some of these um, rather simple um, metrics. And all of that work, this is super depressing as well, right? All of that work, then you like, you're like, oh, there's a line. Uh, so, um, you know, uh, anyway, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, anyway, okay. Um, so what I'm showing here is two different um, real plus 20 um, accepted potential socioeconomic scenarios. One is just business as usual, right? Just every day into the future is like today. Um, the way we use technology, the way we release carbon into the atmosphere, all that kind of stuff. Another one is consumption change, in that uh, we actually change our, our practices so that we consume less, we travel less, all that kind of stuff. And we can see, um, what if we only allow those things to affect land use? What if we allow species to disperse as far as we think is possible and take into account climate change, et cetera, et cetera? And you can see um, the red list index is, is this red one and the living planet index is this blue one. So you can see um, baseline, which is business as usual. Um, I, I should say as you go down, things are, are, are good. So, um, or no, yeah. Um, and you can see that things start to... Um, start to get better if we, if we do something about what's going on, and they don't really, if we don't. Hey, there's a shocking result. Um, <laughs> but it's funny because we allow uncertainty to paralyze us from a decision-making process. So it bothers me that I have to do all that work to tell you something that you already know. But if I didn't, I would be beat back by people saying, well, you don't actually know, right? So uh, anyway, there we go. This is the Mattingly model. This is the much more process-based, complex model. And in it, we're taking a much, uh, within grid cells in, in the Earth at whatever resolution you choose, we, we allow animals of the kinds that you can imagine, heterotrophs and autotrophs, marine and terrestrial, carnivores, herbivores, omnivores, all that kind of stuff. And we, and we put them in there, and we let them go about their business. They chase each other. They eat each other. They grow old. They die. They, um, they have sex. They, they have babies. All sorts of crazy stuff, right? Uh, they eat plants. And, and all of those processes, this is a fundamental bit of the, this process-based model, is that what we want to do, the way we test our model, is we run it, and then we look at the output, and we say, does that output look like an ecosystem looks? We didn't tell it that an ecosystem looks like this. We said, we think this is how individuals within ecosystems interact. And then we take a, a, a coarser level view, and we say, did that build you know, something that, um, that looks like an ecosystem. And what's really fantastic is that we finally got this thing up and running. And, and you know, I could have made something that looked a lot prettier than that that actually didn't do anything. Um, but what's going on is a lot of computation in every one of those grid cells. And we're picking up. I mean, you can already see the seasonal shift in phytoplankton blooms and stuff like that, right? So it's, it's fantastic. We just, with a few simple... Um, kind of agent-based rules, we're allowing the ecosystems to kind of get on with their business, and then we can force them. Once they've, once they've kind of spun up, right, to a realistic state, we can force them with scenarios that we're interested in, like, what if I convert this half of this grid cell to agricultural use? Or what if I take out all the top carnivores in this grid cell? What happens to the ecosystem structure and function? Can we start getting these more... Um, uh, process-based understanding of what's going to happen, but probably more importantly, why is it going to happen? Um, the other thing that, that we've been working on, can we figure out, you know, if animals have to move, how are they going to get from point A to point B, right? For a bird, maybe it's just going to pick up and fly, but what if you're, in this case, a frog, and you've got to go up a mountain, right? If you've ever climbed a mountain, <laughs> you realize that Unlike the, um, the mathematical way that we typically represent them in ecology or um, environmental science, we, we were in a group meeting recently, and there's a peer mathematician in our group, and she said um, exactly what we always you know, try not to say in our group, which is, imagine a spherical animal, right? And, um, <laughs> and, and, uh, 
And therein, therein lies the dichotomy between being computational and, a, and an ecologist. Um, so, but anyway, this is us just trying to figure out how the landscape might constrain an animal which has a limited perception of its local environment. And you can see that um, it really fragments its range as it has to deal with the, the heterogeneity and the elevation. Okay, and finally, um, we're working on decision support tools and working on ways of allowing people to make trade-offs, right? Because I might have my own personal views about what we should do, but that's probably not all that relevant to what we're actually going to do. Um, what is relevant, I think, is that the team that I work in, we do everything possible so that when people do make these decisions, I can say, at least you knew, right? You knew. I gave you the best science. I visualized it in the best way. Maybe you haven't seen some of the best visualization that's coming. Um, but that's what we're really trying to, to work towards. And of course, you know, some of the things is I can't tell you what to do, but I can give you efficient algorithms that um, don't require you to, to throw uncertainty out the window. Maybe you want to purchase a couple planning sites or protected areas. Yeah, I could easily have said uh, maybe you want to purchase a couple data center sites, for example. But you need to do that over time, and the uncertainty of whether or not those sites are going to be available over time changes, et cetera, et cetera. And traditional optimization routines, which we like to steal from control engineering and things like that, really fall down in, in the face of these sorts of uncertainty problems. And so we're working on what we like to call flexible scheduling. Um, so that you can, we can give you a solution that's flexible to the vagaries of, of life. Um, but importantly, we're also learning from the experts. We have relationships, formal partnerships at, at the corporate level with IUCN. We share scientists with um, United Nations Environmental Program here in, in Cambridge. We work closely with professional societies like the British Ecological Society and, and, and nat um, government bodies like Natural England. And, and we're just trying to figure out, well, how do people make decisions so that we can provide the best support possible? And finally, I said we're trying to build a, a prediction engine for the environment and, uh, or for the planet. And all of those pieces are, are efforts over the past several years to, to bring the components together. And finally, we have a bit of a software solution where we're just starting to do that. So I think I have a couple minutes, and I just want to show you um, a, um, a very short um, video of, um, is this going to work? Let's see. I think. And this is a guy named Drew Purvis, a scientist in our group, who, maybe, be an ultimate fail. Um, who is demoing what we call distribution modeler, the very early stages of what we would call the prediction They're engine for the planet. They're going to show you a prototype tool that we built that makes it dramatically easier for all kinds of people to take data and models and make predictions about things that really matter, like food or fire. Here's a fire model showing predictions for fire frequency across the United States for the next 20 years. In general, we know how to make those kinds of predictions. We need to take data and models and combine them together with Bayesian analysis to make predictions. But the technical challenges involved in that pipeline are so severe that it's difficult even for the experts to do that stuff, and most people can't even get started with it at all. Um, so I'm just going to open our uh, prototype. Everything runs in the browser. And what I'm going to do is use this application to build a model that predicts the yield of wheat as a function of uh, the climate. So I'm going to import the file, and we see that it has latitude, longitude, and then the, the yield of wheat. We're going to make a chart so we can see how the yield of wheat varies across the world. And now I'm going to supplement that file with the climate information that we need. So I'm going to use our fetch climate service, which is baked into the application. And just that quickly, I could go and get the temperature. I didn't have to supply it myself. It was supplied by the tool. I can go and get precipitation as well. And immediately then, we can have this table with the yield of wheat, the temperature, and the precip. We can go and make a chart, which shows how the yield of wheat depends on the temperature and precip. So the next step is to build a model of the relationship between the yield of wheat and the temperature and precip and fit that model. Now, the model predicts the yield of wheat, and I'm going to add a dependency of the yield of wheat on air temperature. I'm going to also add a dependency on precipitation. And I've done everything I need now to go and fit that model to the data, which is what's happening here with a fully state-of-the-art uh, Bayesian analysis, MCMC, parameter estimation as we call it.
Um, this has now estimated the parameters in the model, like, for instance, the optimum air temperature of wheat, and it's telling us that the optimum air temperature is about 12 degrees. And here's my predictions, which I'm going to, again, view on the map. It's a very flexible graphical system. We can look at all sorts of different uh, aspects of the data here. And this particular view shows the model predictions, then, across the world, including the uncertainty. So we can put all of those various charts in there, and we can see whether our model looks like the real world, and it does seem to have done quite well. Now, if I want to share this whole analysis with someone else, I just hit a single click up here, and I've just saved a file that I could share with you. You could open it and retrace everything I've done, modify anything, and extend off it to build ever more sophisticated models. So with just a few clicks of the mouse, we've been able to take that model and the accompanying parameters and make it available via the cloud in our Fetch Climate 2 service. You can see that here. You can go forward then and look at some projected possible wheat yields under a climate change scenario. And those same predictions are actually available on a phone. What I hope I've been able to show you is that we can make it dramatically easier for people to go from big data to models to predictions about things that really matter. And that then gives us the ability, hopefully, to make much better decisions about how we look after the planet on which we all ultimately depend. Right. So um, that seemed kind of like a melancholy ending, didn't it? Um, so, um, but the point is, what Drew just did in the three minutes is he went from nothing to a continental scale analysis of wheat yields over, over time into the future under projected climate change. That kind of thinking and an ability to generate those sorts of data constrained but um, uncertainty bounded predictions is, is truly uh, kind of unprecedented in, in, in the world of, of, of um, environmental um, management. So, so with that, um, I'm here. You can ask some questions if you want. Um, and uh, it's probably the first talk I've ever done that I think is less than I was actually supposed to give. Uh, so anyway, thank you. Thanks, Lucas. Very good. Uh, just to open up questions, I know what you're all thinking at the moment, that is, where do I get me a computational ecologist? Right? <laughs> that was outstanding. So any, any, any questions at all for Lucas? Please, Matt. Uh, yeah, you mentioned we only had um, one Earth. Um, have you thought of applying that um, um, uncertainty thing to the Drake equation to find out if there are any more? <laughs> uh, no. Um, <laughs> and I'll tell you why, actually. Um, <coughs> Not to be too antagonistic about it, um, or facetious, but um, I actually think, you know, I got, I got a bit uh, tense when I was saying I, I, it, it bothers me that I have to do this stuff to, to prove to people that, you know, what's already so obvious to, I think, most of us. And um, things like geoengineering and, and people saying, oh, you know, maybe, I, I know you weren't completely serious, but the, uh, you know, people saying, oh, well, we can always kind of find life support on another planet, et cetera, et cetera, that just this is a personal view now, but that just perpetuates this pushing off into the future of don't worry, somebody else will solve it, you know. And I love my kids, but they're three and a half and one and a half, and they're not impressing me that much right now. <laughs> so, like, you know, at the moment, I'm leaving it in my own hands, and I'm not too confident about, about solutions like that. And but. So I, I, sorry, I, I, that's a completely, completely valid point, and that wasn't quite the point yeah. I was making. I was actually interested in whether that, that sort of Bayesian analysis could work for the, the Drake equation, you know, the, oh. you know, working out how many planets there are. I, I'm not seriously thinking we're going to solve our problems by going yeah. there. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> At least you gave me a soapbox, right? Yeah. Um, uh, sure. I, I'm probably not the most qualified to answer that, to be honest. Um, but there are other exceptionally smart people uh, in this room or hiding out in another one that might be able to. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm not sure about the other one. <laughs> um, any, other, any other questions at all? No? Just one question. Um, disease patterns. Have you modeled the impact of climate change and environmental variables on uh, frequency and occurrence of disease and that, how it affects crop yields, for example? Yeah, definitely. So um, we are in collaboration with, uh, so, so what the, the carbon stuff that I was talking about, and I said that was principally done by a guy named Matthew Smith. We all have, um, all the PIs in our group have various 
Well, very different backgrounds. I'm formally trained in wildlife ecology and did my PhD in conservation biology. Um, Drew is a forest <coughs> dynamics modeler, and Matthew Smith is actually a mathematical biologist and a disease epidemiology um, guy. So he, his whole background is in modeling disease. Um, we're starting to work with, um, I'm not sure if I can say, large uh, charitable organizations that are interested in public health um, <laughs> the, to apply these, this software and these techniques to exactly what you just said. Because, again, the disease community um, is waking up to the role of, um, of the environment in, in promulgating disease and, um, and this stuff. I say species, they say species. We're talking about, I'm talking about like furry critters and they're not. Uh, but, you know, it's all the same. So. Great stuff. All right. Thanks again, Lucas. Really appreciate it.